Makahanya Haramita Shinyo Ganji Saibo Zagyo Jananya Haramita Jishogango Gai Guru Sai Guru Yaguja. Welcome to the first in a series of ten talks on the bull herding pictures, sometimes um, also known as the ox herding pictures. This is a, a famous series of pictures that were uh, originally produced um, in the 12th century uh, by a Chinese master whose Japanese name is Kakua. Um, the originals are lost um, and the ones that we see illustrating this talk um, are 15th century Japanese copies by Shubun. Uh, the originals um, are still, or the original ones by Shubun, are still in existence at uh, Shokokuji Monastery in Kyoto, uh, where they can uh, uh, be seen. And in fact, they have them um, also on their website. And this is where Shubun was, in fact, a monk. There are several renditions of the bull herding pictures. Uh, they're not all the same. So uh, these talks, these ten talks, are going to be on the ones by Shubun. Along with each picture, uh, traditionally there's a, an individual preface and also three poems for each picture. And to allow uh, these talks to be uh, uh, not too long, we're just going to look at the picture and also the preface. First of all, perhaps just to say uh, something about uh, the two protagonists who we're going to meet in this talk, or uh, uh, one being the herdsman and the second being the bull. Um, as I said before, sometimes these are called the ox herding pictures. But actually, if we look at the pictures, we can see it's not an ox, um, it's a bull. Uh, and there's a reason for that, because uh, the bull is a capricious creature. Whereas the ox is very much a beast of burden, domesticated, certainly in the east, uh, used for farming and pulling the plough, etc., and somewhat docile. Whereas the bull is something quite different, very full of energy, uh, can be placid, can be fiery. Uh, when you see a sign saying, beware the bull, uh, and one decides to enter that field, uh, one never knows whether the bull is just going to carry on munching the grass or whether he's going to charge. And it's that capriciousness, that unexpectedness, and also that terrific strength uh, that the symbol uh, really represents. Um, and what are these two? Because obviously uh, the story and the ten pictures do form uh, a narrative. Um, uh, it's not just for the process of, or purposes of telling a story. Uh, it's for the purpose of training. This, these ten pictures are uh, an analogy of the spiritual journey. And uh, obviously we are in the Zen Buddhist tradition, uh, and so they are the journey that the practitioner undertakes. And what they show overall is certainly for the first set series, for, from the first picture uh, up to picture number seven, um, they introduce us first of all to the herdsman and then they introduce us to the herdsman and the bull and we can see that there if we look at the pictures in total we can see that there's a coming together uh, of the picture uh, of those two uh, they begin to come together and then once they've really come together they both uh, the, her the bull vanishes the man vanishes uh, and then something happens for the last two pictures which we will uh, come to later on so who are these two? Uh, if, these, if this is a, a training analogy, and uh, indeed, uh, or training allegory, uh, and indeed these two protagonists are a training allegory, what are they pointing at? What are they pointing at inwardly? Well, we may look at the herdsman and we think, well, here's a human being. I mean, some of us may be men, some of us may be women, but we presume that the human being is myself. In other words, it's me, and that would be a mistake. Uh, because it's not me. This is Buddhism. Uh, and the Buddha said, uh, no I. The Buddha said that this I was a delusion. 
an illusion uh, and only an appearance it's only apparent uh, so the herdsman cannot be me cannot be I in fact what the herdsman represents and this is why it doesn't matter whether the practitioner is male or female it's what the symbol represents um, is our basic human nature if we think now about the Buddhist wheel of life uh, hopefully everybody's familiar with it if not please just go and have a quick look uh, you can see that there's that wheel and the main body of the wheel is divided up into six realms there's the god realm the fighting demons the uh, animal realm the hell realm the hungry ghosts and then the human realm and if we look at these six realms and ask ourselves now what do these six actually represent? Uh, well, what they represent uh, is a map of consciousness. They're a psychological map. And they map six types of consciousness. Uh, and elsewhere, if you look on the Zen Gateway website, uh, you'll find material pertaining to these, uh, 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 to these teachings um, under the What is Zen tab and the, and the early Buddhist teachings that we come across the Wheel of Life. And we remember that the Buddha taught that only from the human realm is liberation possible. So these six realms represent states of consciousness that we go through every day and probably many times every day. Uh, when I uh, want something, uh, when I really want something hotly, um, then I'm in the realm of the hungry ghosts who are the wanting beings. Uh, uh, when I'm thwarted and uh, I can't get what I want, I get upset and angry and irritated. And then I'm thrust into the uh, uh, realm of the fighting demons. Um, perhaps I do get what I want and for a moment it's real bliss and I'm quite contented and I'm propelled up into the heavenly realms. And, but sooner or later, because all things are impermanent, I, eventually the, the good times go uh, and I sorely miss them and I become quite not only d disappointed but actually rather depressed uh, by it and so I could be thrust into the hell realms and so on but there's one that one realm which is human and the Buddha said only from the human realm is liberation possible and that human realm is represented by this herdsman here uh, and we remember that this is the human realm the humanity uh, in the eastern view of things not in the west in the west we tend to think that um, of being human is is uh, something that's fallible uh, and weak uh, you know to err is human uh, well I, i'm only human what do you expect of me that sort of thing um, in the east of course the human nature is seen as the best what it is to be the best of of humanity so those things that we look up to a good idea we can get a good idea of what this uh, symbol of the human nature and therefore the herdsman represents if we think about our heroes and heroines those people who are commonly thought of as heroes and heroines they these people personify certain characteristics certain qualities such as bravery such as sticking the course such as goodwill such as self-sacrifice uh, uh, and so on and so forth the buddha of course is a, a, a an heroic figure uh, an heroic spiritual figure so these qualities together combined represent uh, the existence in that human realm and they also exist um, in this herdsman as well but if we look at that herdsman he's he's rather small and the, what else we see of course is that great landscape uh, uh, as well uh, around him and in that landscape to be honest he's rather dwarfed so this is how we find ourselves too um, each of us knows uh, what what it is that we need to do how we're supposed to behave and I think it's probably fair to say that the vast majority of people are uh, would like to be considered reasonably good reasonably tolerant you know um, uh, to be decent human beings in other words we we are concerned about that but the question is do we always bring it off well no we don't because sometimes we're not human sometimes in my hot haste to get hold of something I push something out push somebody else out of the way I remember when I was um, 
uh, quite young and I, I used to go to church for uh, 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 religious education lessons and I remember the teacher who used to take us um, we all considered that she was rather saintly and she looked rather saintly she she looked very uh, pure uh, with a sort of white hair almost angelic she spoke very softly she was always very kind to us uh, and one yeah, she went to the uh, on pilgrimage to the shrine at Lourdes in France, and uh, uh, she told us about it when she came back. She attended mass in the grotto um, where where the shrine is, uh, and she said, "Oh, it was in many ways it was wonderful, but in some ways it was terrible. The crowds were were." enormous and everybody was pressing forward and I remember she said when I was going forward for communion and uh, I, I was looking at people in front of me and they were elbowing other people out of the way and I thought that's disgraceful behavior I mean here in a holy shrine to be behaving like that but she said when I looked down and saw my own elbows were doing exactly the same she said I was really brought up short and we thought oh my goodness uh, she couldn't possibly have sinned, could she? <laughs> well, of course, we were children then, but we know as adults that, of course, everybody does. Uh, I mean, we can be sitting here, I can be speaking, you can be listening. Uh, it's as if butter would never melt in our mouths. Who would think that perhaps in two hours' time we're going to have a blazing row with somebody and slam a door and uh, 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 call somebody names uh, or, or some such thing? Where do those things come from? Well, that wheel of life shows all this. And uh, uh, this is also what the herdsman is looking for. Because the herdsman, one quality in, in Buddhism in particular, uh, one quality that that human realm has is the capacity for wisdom, as well as the warmth of heart, the compassion. And those are the two legs that Buddhism always walks on. We, cannot, uh, we never train with one without the other. We are, always simultaneously training uh, the compassion and the wisdom, the clear seeing and the warmth of heart as well. Um, and those two are always going together. So the herdsman is aware that there's something going on. So this first picture is entitled Searching for the Bull. If we look into that landscape, uh, what we see is that uh, 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 there's no bull. That's the obvious thing. The herdsman is there, but there is no bull. There's just the herdsman in that landscape. And we also notice with that herdsman, look at him. Uh, his feet are pointing one way, uh, but his head is turned another. He's split. This consciousness is, is split. It doesn't really know which way to go. It's, uh, it hasn't really come together yet. And this is also a state that we find ourselves in quite frequently. You know, even something simple like setting up a meditation practice with my best intentions, my, my good human intention. I've considered it carefully and decide that this is something that uh, would be a benefit. Uh, uh, and so give myself to it. But after the initial enthusiasm was worn off, it's almost as if, you know, well, I forget. Uh, and then I forget again to do the meditation and then a week goes by and then two weeks goes by and before I know it six weeks has gone by and I've done no meditation practice and then oh, I feel a bit guilty uh, about it and then I think oh well uh, that's another thing and I just dismiss it from my mind and we are we are like this uh, not very consistent uh, we lack that uh, that constancy, that ability to come together, and that's because head and feet are pointing in different directions. And this is something else. You see, I, although we cannot see the bull, for instance, we know that he's there. We do know that he's there because, well, there are signs all over the place. Sometimes, sometimes I wake up in the morning, and I'm I'm in a funny mood. Uh, and it's like I'm under a cloud all day. No matter what I do, I just can't shake it off. Or perhaps at another time, something happens and it it really bites me. It really goes, strikes me uh, and it upsets me and, and I can't shake it off all day. It could be a, 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 a thought about something or I'm criticized or somebody has a go at me or, or I just start worrying about something or, or somebody out of the blue. That sort of thing, really. Uh, we, we know. 
we know we set our mind and that's already given i set my mind to do something and then it all doesn't seem to work out or the other way around i i decide to myself i'm not going to do that again i got myself into a right old difficulty here uh from now on i'm going to avoid that problem i'm not going to get myself into that situation again and lo and behold uh i do it's rather like the man who walking along in the sort of evening at night time uh can't really see where he's going perhaps he's even had a few drinks and the road is in very bad repair and he walks straight into a hole uh in the middle of that road and falls down into it and he gets up and he jumps up and he can't reach the top because it's a deep hole and uh, he shouts for help but nobody comes so he tries getting himself out and he's not very good at climbing he's never really had to do it before perhaps not very fit uh, and it takes him a long time but eventually Eventually, finding one foothold here and a handhold there, he manages to get himself out. Uh, covered in dirt now and exhausted, he walks along thinking, thank God that's over, and bang, he f falls straight into a second hole. Same thing, this time though, he doesn't bother calling for help because he knows nobody's around. He's got to get himself out, so he applies himself again, and eventually he gets himself out. He takes another six steps and bang, he falls down another hole. Well, this time he manages to get himself out a little bit easier now because he knows now what he's looking for. And he thinks, right, that's it. This road is obviously in very bad repair. Uh, I'm going to have to be careful. And so he looks in the dark, peering very carefully. There's very little light. Uh, but he can see just up ahead of him, yes, there's another hole. And so... It's a big hole, and he tries to skirt his way round the side of it. There's very high hedges on both sides, uh, and he's determined he's not going to fall into it. He stems himself against it, but like the old psychological law says, whatever we uh, push against, uh, uh, I give power over me, and sure enough, almost like a magnet, he falls back uh, into that hole. Well, this time, he gets out of that hole pretty quickly and does that a couple more times as well until finally he's so used to it he literally can spring straight out of that hole and now he sees the the hole in front of him uh, and this time he skirts safely round it and this is this is what we find we fall into holes and we promise ourselves we're not going to do it again and we do we don't know why we don't know why we're in these moods we don't know why certain apparently silly little things upset me but they do or why i become obsessed about certain things or, or i can't get certain things off my mind or i feel that people have got it in for me or i feel um, bad about something and i just can't shake it off uh, and i say oh it's silly it's silly but it makes absolutely no difference so we know that there's something there we we know that despite my best conscience intentions there's something else there and this is when we look at that landscape here, well, we can't see it, but we know it's there. So let's look now at that preface that goes with this picture. The search for what? The bull has never been missing. But without knowing it, the herdsman estranged himself from himself. And so the bull became lost in the dust. The home mountains recede ever further. And suddenly, the herdsman finds himself on entangled paths. Lust for gain and fear of loss flare up like a conflagration, and views of right and wrong oppose each other like spears on a battlefield. Now, perhaps just to say very quickly that the uh, translation for uh, uh, these verses, these prefaces, uh, come from the book entitled Gentling the Bull, the Ten Bull Herding Pictures, A Spiritual Journey, uh, taken from talks by Mio Kioni, uh, and it's published by the Zen Centre in London. So we start. The search for what? The bull has never been missing. But when we look, we see that we can't see the bull, so immediately we say, but the bull is missing. Well, he's not missing, actually. 
The only thing is that we just don't recognize him. He's there. As we've already said, we, we recognize the traces of the bull. We recognize the effects of the bull, even if we don't see him. So, in fact, the bull is there in the landscape already. When we look at that landscape, what do we see? We see a wilderness. We see rocks and trees uh, and some uh, uh, bushes and things like that. Well, this is where we begin to encounter the bull. This is why we don't just sit meditation on a, uh, a mountain top. We practice, the Zen practice takes place in daily life because daily life is that place where we encounter the bull. When I'm once again running headlong uh, into something, uh, uh, when I become upset at something, my boss doesn't appreciate me, um, when the person in front jostles me, uh, when I go for a cup of coffee and there's no milk, or even worse, somebody's put an empty milk carton back into the fridge door. What happens? Well, there's a reaction. Of course, to begin with, I'm full of my own convictions. This shouldn't be. Who puts these empty milk cartons back in there? How dare he cut in front of me like that and jostle me, or whatever it might be. And I'm so caught up with my own self of him, sense of importance and self-righteousness. I think this is not only do I feel I have a right to it, but I feel that these are things that uh, uh, I am perfectly entitled to be and that, and that they are myself. And because I think these things are myself, these thoughts and feelings are myself, that they are mine uh, uh, and, and that um, they are me. Uh, therefore, we don't recognize their true source. We do not recognize their true source. We do not recognize that actually underneath these things, there is a tremendous force. And whenever I don't get what I want, whenever it's something that doesn't suit me in some way, then there is a reaction. And that reaction can take many different forms. Uh, there are at least five other states on the wheel that that force can take and even within those states uh, there are many subtle states uh, if we take something like something that we think is as simple and straightforward as anger for example just think of the many different forms it can be it can be overt it can be a, a punch it can be a shout or a swear it can be a slamming of a door uh, it can be uh, uh, but we also get other forms of anger don't we like passive what's called passive aggressive where uh, there are no outward signs but there's just a sort of non-cooperation or a sort of insolence a feeling of no 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 over my dead body yeah there may be nothing outwardly it may appear quite calm but there's a coldness there's too well these all belong to the same thing uh, because those those fighting demons what well they're not just going out with hot headed anger can also be very cold as well extremely cold uh, and calculating too we don't always recognize it we have vengeful thoughts and as the the old saying goes revenge is, is a dish best eaten cold uh, yes, we don't do it in a rush, but I begin to calculate uh, and to plan. And that's when something really goes wrong, because then it's got me. I think it's rational. I think I'm entitled, and this is perfectly rational. But it's got me, and we don't recognize the motivation or the force that's actually driving this. I remember many years ago uh, seeing a, a film in the 80s uh, with Michael Douglas called The War of the Roses about a couple, it's the story of a couple who fall in love and get married and then they fall out of love and then it becomes acrimonious uh, and they, they own a big house and they want to get divorced but uh, neither of them can move out because that one who does will lose the house and so they start playing tip for tat little vengeance games. He breaks one thing of hers, she breaks one thing of his, and so on. Uh, and there's a, a lovely scene when uh, the, the husband comes into his lawyer and he says, we've sorted it out, we've sorted it out. And he lays out the floor plan of the house. And he says, now the areas 
ringed in blue, those are my rooms, and the areas ringed in red, those are her rooms, and the ones in yellow, uh, those are the mutual rooms, those are the, the common, the ones that we both share, like the bathroom, and etc. And these are the times that each of us can may use those rooms, and at no other time. And the lawyer looks at him and says, does this all sound rational to you? And of course it does. It always does. But people from the outside, they can see that there's a sort of drivenness. There's a compulsiveness. I'm going to get my own way no matter what. And that's what betrays the existence of the bull. Because what is that bull? Actually, because we've talked about the herdsman, but we haven't said who the bull is. Actually, the bull is that tremendous heart energy, that tremendous power of the emotions. And now we remember, because we are in Mahayana Buddhism, Zen is uh, 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 one of the schools of Mahayana, and there is that curious saying that says the passions, which is this heart energy bull, the passions are the Buddha nature, and the Buddha nature is the passions. Now, does that mean that if I let rip with one of my tantrums, that this is a... Uh, it's an expression of my Buddha nature. No, it's not. It's a tantrum. What that saying is pointing to is that the wisdom and compassion of the Buddha is a powered thing. It's, it, has, it is energic. It has a tremendous strength and power in it. And it's the same strength and power that also appears in the blindness of the passions themselves. This is what it's pointing to, that the energy is exactly the same. The energy of the wisdom and the compassion, the energy that is wrapped up in my passions, what I want and what I don't want when it's fired up, is exactly the same. And it's the transformation of that form, that energic form of the passions to the Buddha nature, to the wisdom and compassion of the Buddha nature this is what the spiritual journey is so now we know um, not only who our two protagonists are we have the humanity which is our nature because we are all in the human form and we also have that tremendous elemental energy uh, and those two have to come together uh, so that that energy which exists in this human form can fulfill that human nature so that it is there all the time so that we are always human in all circumstances good bad and indifferent and this is what the buddha meant when he said only from the human realm is liberation possible because we all have human bodies we're born with them but actually what he was talking about was psychologically and spiritually that for as much of the time and all the time really as possible then um, this is uh, to be incarnated in that human form with those human qualities under all circumstances no matter what the outward circumstances are there's a very moving story about a um a monk who had escaped from tibet um after having been arrested and tortured and the dalai lama uh, meet personally meets uh, many of the emigres uh, when they come to Dharamsala and uh, the there was a um, a journalist there who interviewed this monk um, and uh, he said to the monk he said was there any time whilst you were under arrest and being subjected to this torture uh, when you were truly worried for your life and the monk said not really he said, uh, I knew I could lose my life, but he said, that wasn't what worried me most of all. He said there were a couple of times during the torturing when it was particularly bad, when I almost gave in to hating my torturers. That is an incredible thing. Imagine, he feared more falling in to that hating. Why? Because he knows. He knows just how damaging that really can be. And if that hating gets hold of you and it becomes the source of our being, then we are in a very unpleasant situation. It can destroy not only the lives of those around us, but also ourselves as well.
And so those torturers would have taken, not only inflicted that pain, but would also have ruined the rest of his life. And it can do that, of course. And that's what he feared the most, giving in to that. That preserving his humanity he saw as paramount. Without knowing it, the herdsman estranged himself from himself, and so the bull became lost in the dust. So it appears that because we become entangled uh, with my wanting and my not wanting and my convictions and what I uh, think I deserve and so forth, and this is where the bull uh, disports himself, in my, particularly in my opinions, um, he becomes estranged from me. I don't recognize that actually it's the bull behind those convictions. It's the bull behind those moods that when I am depressed, this is the bull just as it is. And this is why when we practice, whether it's daily life practice, or mindfulness, whether it's uh, meditation, it is not a case of trying to blank myself out because we don't want to chase the bull away. Uh, far from it. What we want to do is to allow an approach to in fact develop a relationship uh, uh, with this with this bull this tremendous energy but it has to be done slowly it has to be done carefully as well and this is what all our practices are for but being estranged the home mountains recede ever further away in other words the home mountains these is this is where we're trying to get to and the more we become entangled with these with this sort of briars and thickets of my opinions and what I want and chasing after things, actually the more unhappy I gradually become, the more discontent I become, the home mountains recede ever further. And suddenly the herdsman finds himself on entangled paths. I can't get out of my moods, my feelings. I can't get out of these, my concerns and my anxieties. Lust for gain and fear of loss flare up like a conflagration. And of course, one of the terms for the passions uh, is the three fires. They're found at the center of that wheel of life. Greed, the hatred, and the delusion. Hatred can also mean fear as well. It's that aversion. Lust for gain and fear of loss flare up like a conflagration. And views of right and wrong oppose each other like spears on a battlefield. And just how often is it when, for example, something happens sets me off and particularly if i'm in a situation when i can't just burst out like this uh, 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 for example and i take it away and it goes round and round and round and round in a sort of inner video loop um, and she says and then i said and that what i should have said was and the next time and all the rest of it and it goes on and on and on until it works itself completely out all passion spent and then uh, I sort of flop uh, like, an, uh, uh, like an empty sack and I now have to wait until that energy begins to build up again uh, uh, in, so that I can at least feel myself and then of course something else happens and it goes on because we're habituated to it and this is this views of right and wrong oppose each other like spears on a battlefield so here we have it a herdsman he knows there's something wrong. And this is how a lot of us find ourselves. We, we know there's something and we need to do something about it, but we're not really sure what. So this herdsman very much uh, depicts us at the beginning of our journey. And we'll leave it there for now.